Yes, that's me. Um, now I get to talk, and uh, that's a bit of a different uh, kind of act than what I often do when I make films, which is something that demands an incredible amount of patience and sometimes demands uh, that I put myself aside to make room for others. Um, I don't think I need to point at this to anyway. Okay, we start here. This is, um, of course, a brain. Um, whenever we do creative work, whenever we create something, um, it, of course, starts with the brain. And the reason I show this picture is also because I've oftentimes experienced that my brain capacity is extremely limited. Um, and oftentimes I experience how dumb I really am. And to experience that and to acknowledge that is actually something that I've come to learn can make me a better artist. And that the space that it gives when you start to acknowledge that you're not a genius and you don't need to be a captain, that space can actually uh, be a, an amazing ground to create work. And to move on from that, I think that listening is a big, big part of that. So um, when I was invited to come and talk about collaboration, I very fast thought, okay, we should talk about listening. And the reason for that is that in the last year, some people have come up to me that I work with and told me, you're actually very good at listening. And I don't know, in the beginning, I, I didn't really uh, like it that much because I want to be an artist who can sort of be the captain of the ship. And and uh, I didn't really connect that so much with uh, the essence of what I do. Um, but the funny thing is that sometimes I think the things you're best at might be the things that you don't acknowledge yourself. And part of listening maybe is to start acknowledging what you do when you do what you do. So making this talk for me, I thought it should be um, an investigation for myself into what is it I do when I do what I do. And based on the um, theme of listening. So I asked Miriam, who is a producer, uh, what's she thinks when we talk about listening, what, what um, is the important understanding of how you listen? And um, I went out and asked her and other people what they think when they look at me and how I work. And um, Miriam thinks that I work in chaos. Um, she thinks that I um, listen without judgment, open, and uh, watch what happens without um, judging it. And that listening is also keep observing until an opening reveals itself. This is something I'll get back to. But I thought, okay, that's interesting. We'll move from there. Um, then I asked my uh, girlfriend what she thinks I do when I listen. And I asked her, do you think I listen well? And she said, yes, just not to me. Um, and then I asked her, what is it I actually do when I listen? And she said, you're calm, patient, and very present. You have a way of being present and interested, but simultaneously withdrawn. And I think that that's a, an essence of how I work when I make documentary, that I'm very much there, but at the same time, I have to be very with withdrawn to have an overview to have an idea about potentials and where we're heading. So there's an interesting double kind of presence there. This is her. This is my 
two sons. We came back from Portugal three o'clock last night. Um, she also told me, you allow people to finish their sentences, then give a moment's pause, acknowledge them, maybe make a small comment, and then open for them to continue. And this is maybe just good behavior oftentimes, but, but it's funny for me to sort of start thinking about how do I actually act when I'm around people, especially when I am in a working situation when I want to listen. And, and it's kind of true, that's, that's how I behave. Um, you have a way of showing respect towards the person in front of you by setting yourself aside. And your emotions are not what occupies you, she said. And I think that thing about emotions is very, very interesting because oftentimes our emotions take up too much space. What I feel takes up a lot about my, my mind. So um, to be able to actually be present, to feel emotions running through you, but just to let them pass, not to necessarily react. And there's a mix between if you experience something that is very emotional, like a person who tells you a very emotional story, you can overact, you can overengage. Um, and that can be a problem because suddenly you start to take the space. So you can react in an um, empathic way without taking the space. At the same time, you have to react because that person just told you something very emotional. So it's always finding that balance where you become a mediator. Uh, listening has uh, to do with all the senses. It's the body language. It's the eyes, how you look at the person, eye contact. It's how you engage with handshake, touches. All these things are part of what you listen with. And I think there is a body language that can really open up and engage the other person to feel like that person is being listened to. Here are some of the sort of rules that I try to um, apply when I listen in a work situation. My intentions are there, but I put them on hold. I know what I want from there, but I also just put it aside. I am genuinely curious and genuinely patient so uh, it's okay for me to spend four hours listening to someone without really knowing where we're going. Um, I try to be an intelligent listener because I think that that relationship that I develop with the person that I'm filming also demands that that person feels like I'm someone that person can respect, someone who knows what that person is very knowledgeable about but I still only talk 10% of the time. So there's an invitation. I actually understand what you're talking about. We can somehow be on the same level, but you're the one who's doing the most of the talking. Sometimes I lie too. I pretend like I know more than I do. So uh, that can be sort of nodding. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I experienced that too. Um, sometimes you do that because it sort of brings the other person along. Um, but it can also be the opposite. I can be humble and honest about something I don't know. I'm currently working on a film from Syria with Syrians who filmed there for four years. And they know Syrian history, they know the conflict to a degree that I will never be able to compete with. So on the one hand, I need to be able to make them feel like I'm able to communicate their story in a respectful way that also is intelligent enough and understands the conflict enough. But the I register my feelings, such as when I was working on that film la uh, three weeks ago, the main characters, uncle and cousin, is killed that morning. And again, that's very emotional. I register my feelings, but still try to let them pass and be noted for later. Um, I act as an empathic companion, but at the same time, it's also 
her life and not my life. So I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist trying to solve that situation. A lot of listening is also letting go of your pride. So I have to be able to say my pride is on the back burner and um, I might be um, in a situation where someone says something really nasty to me or um, someone wasted waste my time, three hours I'm waiting for that person. A lot of different situations where you as a director, you really have to just let go of your pride and say, I'm not important. It's the product we're making, the film that we're making, that's important. Another thing about pride is to um, not care where the good idea comes from. It doesn't matter. And again, going back to wanting to be a genius or a captain, you also want to be the one with the good ideas. But oftentimes that can be in the way of the really good idea presenting itself. And that can come from anywhere. You really have to let go of that pride. Um, back to uh, Miriam, the film producer. She says, the type of listening I experience you are capable of is to dare to be a listener, continue to listen instead of solve, until you can position yourself in a new way that opens up, understood as a new place where things can grow from. When I was doing the research for this talk, I came across a guy called Otto Sharma who writes about listening. And he writes something interesting about this very thing. Uh, he says there are four levels of listening. The first one is what he defines as downloading. It can be sort of what you do when you're in school. You listen, you download, you don't engage. You don't actually necessarily even relate to what's being told. You just download. The next level that appears is when you engage into a debate. That's typically when you're there with your opinion and another person with another opinion, and you debate. But you're not really changing your own position, your perspective. That's what happens when you engage into a dialogue. That's when you actually start taking in what the other person says, and that can actually change the position that you're in. It's not about being right or wrong. It's not about who wins. It's how can we move somewhere together. Sharma defines the fourth level of listening as what he calls cr collective creativity, which is that the dialogue is not about the here and now, but it's about future potentials. So what I'm taking in becomes a collective creativity that happens together. It's kind of difficult to explain, but what he says is, is it possible that the best place to lead would be from the emerging future? From what is just about to happen now, leading from a field of possibilities that we create together. To uh, give a very concrete example, this film from Syria has been filmed by a woman over four years. And as I'm sitting there working together with her, she says, I think it should be based on the chapters of the Genesis, the seven days of creation. And my um, knowledge as a filmmaker, uh, as a storyteller is that, oh, that's a very complicated idea you bring onto the table there. And my gut feeling says, let's throw it out. But I put that aside and I say, okay, we make room for this idea, we see where it takes us. And I have the patience in that situation to say, okay, let's see what comes out of this. And then we start to elaborate on that idea. If it's a bad idea, it will definitely disappear along the way anyway. If it's a good idea, maybe it can be a unique ground for something different that otherwise, if I just used my experience as a filmmaker, then I would probably just reproduce things that are already being made. And I think that that's the interesting thing about truly listening, is that creative work of a unique kind can actually come out of that. 
It's not something that comes out of being in your safe spot, building on the knowledge that you already have or the craft that you have. It's that meeting between that and then that input from outside. And in the case of the Syrian film, that's actually going to be told in the chapters of the seven days of creation, going through the Syrian conflict. And that might sound very weird, as I say it now, but I think it'll be a very cool way, actually. Yesterday, we had the first screening of a film that I did called Life is Sacred. It was in a, I mean, it's been film screened many times, but it was the first screening in Colombia. This is the main character, Antanas Mokus. And um, he's been mayor of Bogota twice and head of the opposition in Colombia. And this is uh, Sergio Fajardo, who is uh, mayor of Medellin, former mayor, and possibly going to be the next president in Colombia. And they were there, but I couldn't be there, sadly. Um, but um, it was very interesting to hear the response from Colombia seeing this film. But to go back to the listening that I talk about, um, I'm going to show a clip from the film now where um, Antanas, who is a son of an artist, his mother is an artist, she's very old, uh, he became a philosopher, then he became a politician, he's a very unique kind of politician. Um, he goes and visits visits his mother. And the way that this scene came about was me knowing that there were things I wanted to get out of that meeting, but at the same time empowering him to take charge of the situation. So it's not me sitting him down and saying, now you do this, now you act like this. It's me having communicated with him over four years to the extent where he intuitively even, knows what kind of story we are building together. And through that, he can take charge of the scene in that dialogue with his mother. And I think that the uniqueness of that scene, it's a scene I love a lot, uh, comes from that kind of relation that's been built. And if like we often do as directors, I came in and, as we say in Danish, instructed him how to do it. Then I would have killed it beforehand. So we sort of have to work in a space where we create a space. We direct, which is a much better word than the Danish instruct, uh, a line, a, a sort of a roadmap together with, in this case, a documentary main character and then he can start taking charge himself of the situation and expose his own story, his relation to his mother in this situation. It's after um, he almost won the presidential election and, um, and he's sort of dealing with the aftermath of that. Did I make a difference in my life? Um, so we see the scene now. Go ahead. Esta era la, el comedor cuando éramos niños. Esto se llama Cerca de la Muerte. Esa sala a mí me parece de lo más valioso que, de la obra de mi madre. Pero la sociedad colombiana no aceptó esa mirada tan cruda. Entonces, el resto de, de, de la obra de mi madre es abstracto. It seems like it's out of sync. Just a second, let me see again. Better. Esta era la, el comedor cuando éramos niños. Esto 
se llaman? Cerca de la muerte. Esa sala a mí me parece de lo más valioso que, de la obra de mi madre. Pero la sociedad colombiana no aceptó esa mirada tan cruda. Entonces, el resto de, de, de la obra de mi madre es abstracto. Entonces, en, en cierto sentido, el, el, el verdadero arte y la verdadera política incomodan. No son amables, no. son la liga. Sorry, it, um, something technique happened in the keynote. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, just to say what happens in the scene is he sits there and talks about his work. She challenges him. They talk about how um, the meaning of work in her world as an artist and his work as a politician uh, plays out between them. And The film will, will um, have the Danish premiere in August, so you can all see it there. It'll, uh, I'm sorry about this. But the point of what I'm trying to say is we need to rewrite, I think, the understanding of what a creative process can contain. And that the work as a director is much more as a mediator than as someone who directs the ship as a big, important captain. This is a theater play I did this spring in Aarhus Theater called On Off. And um, this here represents the internet because most of the play takes place online. The work with the actor, it was very interesting to move from working with a real person playing himself to working with actors playing other people. The work with an actor is not essentially very different. I asked, this is um, Kim Baisko, he's sort of grand old man in Aarhus Theater. Um, he plays Wikipedia, there's Google. Um, so we have a lot of characters from the uh, online world playing out there on stage. Um, and after we had the premiere of the play, he came up to me, we were both drunk, and he said, ah, I, I think you uh, were a good director, you good at listening, but also you can see. And I called him and I told him to um, elaborate what did he mean by that. So um, what Kim said was, if there's anything an actor loves, it is to be seen, no matter if it's good or bad, It should be tried and seen, because respect grows from that. And I think that that's really essential, because as a director, again, I cannot force anybody to do anything. The best acting comes out of the actor being, how can you say, empowered to c own that character, to own that scene. And the only way that I can do that is by giving that person space to find that and then help and guide that along. And it goes back to what I call the 10% rule, which is that my ideas are generally very bad and 90% of my ideas are typically bad, but 10% might be okay. For my ego, it's very lucky that it also applies to other people's ideas. So um, the whole notion is that if we start bringing these ideas together onto the table, our brain capacity might actually be able to create something. And in order to make that space, I also as a director cannot pretend to know when I don't. There's a lot of anxiety that's created in that space. Because when I work with an actor, for example, the actor wants to be secure. They want answers, they want solutions. And oftentimes as a director, you 
tend to want to satisfy that. And oftentimes that's the worst thing you can do. Because the only thing that's going to come out of that is a very bad idea. And then everybody's stuck to that idea. And think that that's... I mean, they're happy because it creates security. But really it's a very bad situation. Because you've just solved a problem like peeing in your pants. So it's also allowing and creating a space where you're allowed as a director to say, I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe we'll find out along the way. Because it's not my problem to solve a problem. It's my task to create a space where we investigate together to find solutions along the way. Sometimes I even have to, again, lie, postpone decisions and be a fool. Because the lie can help in the sense of creating some kind of security. Let's say we have an actor, I have an actor, who is very anxious, who feels like everything is falling apart. You want to create some kind of space where that person can grow from. And that can be also done by lying, saying, okay, we do this scene this and this way. You know it's not going to be done that way. But we leave it there, so we can move on. And then along the way, we'll go back, we'll revisit, we'll be more knowledgeable, and then we'll solve it. Again, postponing decisions that way. Another way is acting like a fool. It can be uh, using irony, it can be just make yourself foolish. Uh, because that allows the other person to be foolish also. And that creates that space where bad ideas are brought to the table so that one of the good ideas can also be found. And that's all about making invitations in the creative room. The big challenge there is how do I don't lose control of the thing? How doesn't everything just become mud? And this is uh, Kim saying it's important to stand by your idea, clean out the bad ones, protect the whole. Don't be vague. It's a risk. And it is a big risk. And I oftentimes have found myself being vague. And I try to learn how to be better at my job so that that doesn't happen. Because as a director, my job is mainly to secure that the whole is protected and that, we've, that I'm the good one at finding those good ideas when they appear. And to be able to do that, I think that the listening is also something that you have to extend to yourself in order to know your strengths and your weaknesses. So I generally am quite good at coming up with ideas that relate to this. But I'm also very bad at coming up with ideas that relate to story structure. So I have to listen more in this area. And I have to make sure that I find people who are very strong on that. So I listen more there. So I have to choose very few close advisors carefully. Those I allow into my space to come with solutions. But at the same time, I have a pool of 100 advisors. Because it's very important, I think, to bring people in. Because you do learn something all the time when you get feedback. But what you mostly learn is where your problems are, not where your solutions can be found. So um, that's also a big part of it, sort of be very open, but find solutions together with very few people who intimately, intimately knows what you're aiming for. Um, a big part of it is also to um, define rules and borders, saying, this is the space within which we are finding solutions. In the case of the theater play, it happens on a stage. It's about the online world. So one rule we made was that nothing here is digital. Everything is analog. If something is represented as, let's say, a pop-up, it's a trap door in the floor, or something that flies through the stage. Um, so that was one rule that was applied. And to start defining those rules more and more creates boundaries that also teaches other people on the team that this is the space within which we are coming up with ideas and solutions. And that's also what I call developer vocabulary together with people. 
It starts from the very early beginning, and then it elaborates and becomes more and more defined along the way. Another thing that I try to note in my notebook is always to remember first impressions. Oftentimes, like in the Colombian film, for example, I saw a um, piece of footage and I was very moved by it. And it was him going through a crowd of people who were celebrating him after he um, secured the peace process a year ago. And um, it was just very moving. The second time I watched that clip, it's less moving. The third, the fourth, the tenth time, in the end I don't feel shit. So um, it's very important to remember that first time and then to say and trust that that will be what other people experience as well. Um, trust your idea and the vocabulary blindly, but also constantly challenge it. So that in the end, we can uh, create one big brain together with an on button. It's my great graphic skill here. Um, and, um, and that's, I think, what I've learned so far about listening and being a film director. <laughs> Thank you.